Welcome everybody to Monday. We're going to be finishing off social social impact of computer science, at least for now. And we're going to be moving on to um, talking about science. Okay, so uh, a few last notes as far as um, social issues of computer science goes. Um, there's a movie called The Minority Report with Tom Cruise that came out a long time ago. And uh, the notion was the police would be able to get a report uh, that somebody would commit a crime prior to the crime happening. And they would go and arrest the person. And, uh, of course, this was considered to be science fiction, it's fantasy, this would never happen in real life. Except, um, you know, it is. So, uh, the, the Tampa Bay Police Department has the most aggressive predictive policing program, say that three times fast, in the country. And so basically what they do is they have a program that every month gives the local police a list of 10 names of people who aren't like necessarily criminals or just people in the neighborhood that are likely to commit crimes in the next month. And this program is proprietary. You don't have any idea how the algorithm arrives at these 10 names, but if your name's on the list, sucks to be you. The police come to your house. Hey, how you doing? What you up to? What are you doing today? Follow you around town. Make sure you don't commit any crimes. Talk to your parents. Hey, is your kid smoking joints? Is your kid doing the marijuana? Talk to your girlfriend. Do you know your boyfriend is on the top 10 list of people likely to commit a crime this month? So, uh, I don't know how that's, uh, I'm not streaming? Oh, jeez. Uh, how about now? You see now? Okay. So, um, you didn't really miss much. It's just a slide. So the, the notion is, uh, you know, to, to cut down on crime, right? You identify potential criminals and you go and harass them and make their life miserable until they move out of your area. And then, you know, you have a nice, peaceful neighborhood. Um, and, uh, one of the, one of the really important things to understand when it comes to computer science is that there's this notion that because a computer has targeted somebody for harassment, it's not us doing it, right? Like you can always blame, you know, any problems on the computer, on the algorithm, right? You can't blame us. The program is perfect. In fact, the Duke person who ran the uh, the racism uh, workshop that I went to a year ago, um, they had a bug in their attendance system. They had me enrolled twice in the system, and they sometimes sent the event invites to one and sometimes to the other, and at the end of it, they told me that I would not receive my certificate, which I don't really give a damn about, like who cares, uh, because I didn't attend enough events. And I'm like, all right, what events did I miss? And they're like, you missed these events. And I'm like, I went to some of those. you know. And they're like, are you saying that programs aren't perfect and could make mistakes. And I'm just like, this is literally the kind of stuff that you've been talking about all semester. Yes, they do make mistakes. In this case, it's because you had me enrolled twice in the program. And and it's like, you know, like, very hypocritical, very hypocritical that you would, um, on one hand, talk about all the mistakes the computers can make and how this can cause bad consequences for people. And on the other, just be like, how dare you suspect that our attendance system is imperfect? And said she said a bunch of nasty things as well. So, uh, yeah. So that's that's one thing to always keep in mind when you uh, when you work with computer science is that just because a computer is telling you to harass somebody doesn't absolve you of any responsibility, at least in you know most people most people's eyes. Um, Florida man awarded thirty seven thousand dollars after cops mistake glazed. You donut crumbs from meth. A <laughs> uh, guy dropped off a friend at chemotherapy and was driving home an older woman for a church. Uh, police pulled him over when he handed over his driver's license. Uh, they noticed his concealed weapons permit. Confirmed he has a pistol. Asked him to step out of the car for her safety. And uh, they said, could we search the car, which is always a bad idea. Like if, if they have to ask, they don't have probable cause to say no, you know, uh, cause they can do stuff like this. Right. 
they have uh, drug dogs that you know will signal if you have drugs and they'll also signal if the handler thinks that they have drugs you know it's one of the big you know secrets of the canine division is that the, the dogs pay attention to the handler if the handler is like really nervous the dogs can signal as well and then they're like oh he's got marijuana on him and then they seize your money and, and whatever so uh you want to tell me about what we found nothing to find you know some crystals it's glazed from a crispy cream donut Yeah, and uh, it would be funny if uh, if it didn't happen, right? Like, um, if you really want to be mad, <laughs> like if you don't, if you don't, if you if you're not mad mad today, and like you want to feel mad, uh, look into how asset forfeiture works. Um, basically, the government loves it because it's free money for them. What they do is they uh, seize your assets, and then you have to sue them to get it back. And they can sue your, they can seize your assets without charging you with a crime or having any evidence that a crime was committed. Okay, so you have to sue them. They they seize your your um, like they they seize like the wood for like guitars and things like that. And um, um, I don't know which one of this is. And then you have to sue them. Like it's the complete opposite of how the criminal justice system normally works. Normally you're innocent until proven guilty with asset forfeiture. You're guilty until proven innocent and they just take your car or they take your money, right? So uh, traffic stop, uh, let's see, um, guy had $91,000 on him. Uh, he had been saving $91,000. He was gonna buy a music studio in cash. And so they pulled him over and they took all $91,000 he was not accused of a serious crime. He got a $25 ticket for improperly wearing a seatbelt. So, because he wasn't properly wearing a seatbelt, they felt justified in seizing $91,000 from the guy. And then uh, he has to try. He has to try to get his money back. <laughs> and uh, they forfeited the morning the money without noting him until after it happened. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. These kinds of stories are like all over the place and, and cops and the, you know, police all over the country love it because it's just free money from them. They just get to take money. They don't have to go through any, uh, you know, they don't have to convict somebody of a crime. It's just free money. So for, um, uh, for example, a friend of mine, uh, was a landlord and some people were growing pot on his land. And so they came in, they arrested all the people that were growing pot, released them because they didn't care about him. And then they tried seizing his land, right? Because that's what they wanted. They didn't care. Like, if they cared about crime, they would put those people in jail, right? Like, it, it's just the most blatant, like, rage-inducing, like, thing that you can imagine, right? Because it's still a federal, federal crime to grow marijuana. And, uh, and so you come in, you arrest people, you let them go, who cares? We don't care about you. Uh, your land was involved in the use of a... Of a criminal activity we're seizing your land now you get to sue us to try and get your land back and you have to pay a lawyer and you spend a hundred thousand dollars getting his own land back yeah so i don't know what you all think of that uh this is this is an issue where i will wear my heart on my sleeve a hundred percent um asset forfeiture to me it's just, um yeah i i think it's unconstitutional i think it should be banned everywhere i'm just gonna I'll, i normally don't like take a side on on issues like this but yeah, I, I think that's one where I'm just going to tell you how I feel. Like, it is it is absolute garbage from a constitutional point of view. Okay, um, fine. It, just having large amounts of cash on you is evidence of a crime, right? Because you must be drug dealer. Yeah. And, uh, and that's not true, right? <laughs> like, there are people who carry large amounts of cash on them. A friend of mine, uh, back in the 90s, his family was visiting from Kuwait. And so as uh, Palestinians living in Kuwait, uh, they were coming to America for a long vacation. And so they just had like $100,000 in cash on them, right? And um, while they were in the area to America, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and s s took their house and the, their bank accounts were all frozen and everything like that. So they found themselves in America with 100,000 in cash. So it was good. They carried lots of cash on them. It, it doesn't mean you're a criminal, right? Um, 
And so with that 100000 in cash, rather than going to Disneyland and blowing it like they're planning on doing it, uh, they bought a 7-Eleven in uh, Northridge, L.A., the Valley, uh, and uh, started a new, new life in America. <laughs> they didn't get their cash back for like 15 years or something like that. Okay, uh, any, any uh, thoughts on that? Post in the chat channel now. There's been nothing posted for almost 10 minutes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Chicago used to have a predictive policing system, and then they got rid of it because it was causing more problems than it solved. Um, a big issue with these, these sorts of things is the lack of transparency. Right, last time we talked about the compass system, uh, ProPublica did a um, in-depth analysis of Compass, and uh, what's interesting uh, is that you might think that I treat these things uh, sort of unironically. There you go. There's the ProPublica article, and I don't like because I'm a critical thinking professor, right? So I actually read the whole the whole thing, and and this this story here is taught in ethics classes for computer science now all across the country. I was just at a conference. We all know about it. We all teach it. But here's the thing. The ProPublica analysis, in my opinion, is actually wrong. So uh, the, the, big, uh, the big problem with the analysis of the Compass algorithm is that they use the term recidivism in a different way than everyone else. Right? So we looked at more than 10,000 criminal defendants and compared their predicted recidivism rates with the rate that actually occurred over a two-year period. The, the problem is... The problem is, if you send somebody to jail, they're unlikely, like let's say you send somebody to jail for two years, they're unlikely to be a recidivist, right? And so if you don't measure the time window for recidivism from the time they're released from jail, instead when you book them into jail, you will get wrong numbers. The more, like... The more serious the criminals will have a lower recidivism rate because they're in jail already, right? And um, we compare the recidivism risk categories predicted to the actual after two years when they were scored, right? And they're scored when they're sentenced, not when they're released. So, you know, they said it was highly inaccurate, and I don't know. I've, I, you know. I'm, I'm hoping that's just a you know mistake on their part, but from what I can tell from reading their, their, their analysis is that they just screwed up. Like, you know, people in jail can't be recidivists, you know? And so violent criminals were miscategorized 80% of the time. Yeah, because they're in jail. <laughs> you know, like, they can't. Uh, okay. So, nope, nobody on, uh, nobody on chat. Post your thoughts now. I'll, I'm just going to, just gonna wait until we get at least six people saying things on Discord chat. We we just talked about predictive policing, talked about asset forfeiture, and we talked about Compass, this program that is used to assess people of being at high risk or low risk of recidivism. Okay. Type now. I'm gonna pause the stream. Good, good comments on Discord. Um, and I, I do like it when people have different ideas and they'll just repeat back to me what I, I have up on here. You know, Mr. Chattery said, uh, I feel predictive policing is a good system to catch criminals and prevent crimes from happening. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's why that's why they're implemented, right? It's with, uh, with good, good intentions. And, um, you know, if you could you know, have an algorithm say, hey, this liquor store is likely to be robbed on Friday night, you know, you send a cruiser by, you know, maybe you stop the crime before, you know, maybe you can figure out patterns and, you know, people's behaviors and help stop crime, you know, and the, um, what Drew said, all these systems have some sort of benefit, but I feel when they don't end up working right, there could be big problems. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point too, you know? And it, the trouble is like, it's not even like, like, let's say that it, it was working right in Tampa, right? That the list of 10 people most likely to commit crimes were in fact the most likely to commit crimes. 
and by having the deputies come by and kind of harass them and knock on their doors and talk to their parents and follow, drive, drive after them, follow them around, they could cut down on crime. Yeah. It's still, it's still an interesting question of if they should, right? Because harassment's not cool. I don't know. Like, it, it just seems like there's some sort of, like, you know, moral principle where, like, if you're not committing a crime, then the police don't really have the right to come by and harass you. You know what I mean? And, and harassment's kind of a weird thing, like, to, to prove, you know, and, like, if it's just, like, one time, but if it's a repeated pattern, you know... And these are typically poor people, so they can't afford a lawyer to, like, you know, do something about it. Like, hey, stop harassing my client, you know? So, um, wouldn't that make the algorithm a de facto crystal ball? No. Well, we don't know how the programs work, for one thing, right? Like, that's that's a big problem for me. Like, if, if you're going to be using programs to put people in jail, right? Protective policing isn't directly putting people in jail, but kind of, you know. I mean, if the cops go by and they see that, you know, they smell pot or whatever when they go knock on the door of the person's house, you know, it could lead to an arrest, you know. That I think um, the algorithm should be transparent, right? For a number of reasons, like, you know. They did an analysis of the... Uh, uh, racial impact on it and, and it wasn't having a disparate impact on race but you know how are you how are you doing this you know if you're sending people to jail and in, in, in the American legal system you have a right to confront your accuser right and in these cases are like well we're not accusing you of anything we're just using these programs to sentence you to longer jail sentences right and it, it seems to me to be a little bit of a dodge around the issue right because you know how do you how do you know like how do, how do you know these things are in any way accurate you know the company says they are but you know it's it's, it's troublesome all right if you can't see the source code for it okay so in general this this concept is called algorithmic bias algorithmic bias is when um, even if you have a fair algorithm even if you did not uh, do what uh, uh, Raymar uh, Verasaro said which is like even if you didn't deliberately program bias into an algorithm, even if you don't use race as a factor in determining who gets a home loan or not, it can still generate disparate outcomes. Because the training data that you use to do the training of your neural net or whatever machine learning thing you're doing, it learns from the training data, right? And so if you, uh, if you teach it that this is what a criminal looks like and you had biased police departments in the past, the machine learning system will pick up that bias from the pattern of people that are arrested and bring it forward into the future. But now it's code washed, right? Because now it's not us, it's just the computer, but the computer is learning the bias of the past. So you have to be very careful about it, right? That your training data is not biased, right? And then, you know, there's almost like an infinite regress problem of like, well, how do you know that the training, you know, and, you know, how do you, you know, how do you come up with an unbiased data set? You know, it's a really difficult question, especially when it comes to like criminal laws and things like that. So, uh, like I was telling you at Fannie Mae, they will look at the disparate impact of their, their code. And, uh, and if it is biased, then they redo it and they keep redoing it until it works uh, randomly which is somewhat disturbing to me. Okay, so uh, for those of you at home, uh, talk about one of those three topics, asset forfeiture, pretty crime, uh, which is predictive policing, or the uh, Compass program. We're going to talk a little bit about science now. We've all seen the scientific method before, right? Show, show of hands and chat. How many people here have seen the scientific method? Ask a question, state a hypothesis, conduct an experiment, analyze the results, make a conclusion. Uh, you've seen this before. Good. 
Thumbs up. Yes. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Except this one is also the scientific method. Problem. What are you trying to figure out? Write this in the form of a question. Materials used. There's no materials used here. Hypothesis. What do you What do you think you're going to find out? Procedures. Make a detailed list of steps. It's, none of these are on here. Like hi hypothesis, I guess. Results. What did you observe? And analyze. I guess maybe that's results. I don't know. Conclusion. From what you observed, how would you answer your original question? Like. <clears throat> And in some of my uh, presentations, I have like a dozen of these things. And each one of the posters that teach students the scientific method are all different. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> right. The, the, the problem is that there isn't really anything called the scientific method. There's a bunch of things that we call the scientific method, but there's not one. Okay. So it's not like there's a scientific method that all scientists follow and things like that. It's sort of... A mm, kind of depends on the field you're in. They're related to each other, you know, like the way that you do science and biology and chemistry are probably pretty similar, you know. Uh, but I can tell you how it works in academia, the scientific process, right? Let's say I'm a bioengineering professor. Okay. The step one is come up with an idea that'll get funding. <laughs> that's step one right what is the NSF gonna fund and so what you do is you go to the you go to the NSF's website and you look at past grants they funded look at their current you know things all right you know is the is the 2p grant out all right let's take a look at this NSF 2p or uh, dosi or you know right, what kind of funding opportunities are available now, all right, all right, let's take a look at this, and, uh, okay, so they want to provide high school teachers with professional development and ongoing support. Okay, so that's going to be my, uh, that's going to be my hypothesis. I'm going to come up with a new program that will increase the uh, proficiency level of high school teachers in computer science. That's step one. And if you think I'm being sarcastic, I kind of am, but I'm kind of not. Uh, you, you, yeah, uh, the, the academia game is very much motivated by what grants are out there and what the grants are funding, right? If you're a small business, then you can go and look at what small business grants are available, right? And, you know, the, uh, I remember um, looking at it a couple years ago and the Department of Defense was interested in making a helmet that had audio sensors on it, and when a bullet flew by, it would try it would tell you where the bullet came from. It's a pretty cool idea. I don't think they exist because they were funding grants to do it, but I was like, oh, that's a cool idea. Yeah. And so our hypothesis, we can make a helmet that can deduce where, you know, a bullet came from or something like that. More of an engineering more of an engineering problem than a science problem, but yeah. so uh, then the materials used, uh, yeah, you actually kind of work out a budget next. Like, you're like, okay, so this grant is for $5 million over five years. So we got a million a year. Uh, it's going to cover my summer salary and my co-PI's summer salary. And then we're going to buy this many computers. And so, yeah, your budget's kind of the second step. And uh, you bring on partners and you have to whittle it down sometimes because you go over budget. And you, know, you basically come up with a budget. And then, uh, yeah, the hypothesis is just like directly from whatever you know, your funding sources, like, you know, if I'm a, a bioengineering professor and there's a, um, a lot of money available for like cardiac heart research, then our hypothesis is, uh, if we, uh, I don't know, maybe you're testing a new drug, this drug will improve the QT interval or whatever in a, in a heart, you know, or, uh, you know, sometimes just basic research. Like we want to understand the impact of, electrolytes in the blood on people with prolonged QT or whatever. And, you know, you but you kind of match your hypothesis to what's being funded, right? And then the procedures, yeah, you, then you detail like your set of steps you're gonna do. Like we're gonna get some rabbits, uh, that uh, we're gonna buy rabbits that have elongated QT intervals and um, 
we're going to have a control group and an experimental group and the control group will just be left alone the, the experimental group is going to be given a high salt high sodium diet and then we're going to measure their you know we're going to give them an ekg you know every week or something like that and then that's you know but that derives directly from your funding source right and then the results you know you, you then you then you submit so the next step after procedures is you submit your grant and and cross your fingers and hope that you get funded and if it doesn't get funded you end the scientific method there you didn't get funded not going to do any science with that money and then um you do get funded that's the next step okay cool you have to go to like a conference oftentimes and learn about how to run a grant okay well that's not really going to be on a middle school poster and then uh then you actually do the experiment which isn't it which isn't on here at all right like they don't, they don't actually have do the experiment on this one on this one they do right so then you finally got money you get the rabbits you run the thing for a year gather your data and then you analyze the results and the final step isn't exactly the conclusion the final step is publication right so the final step is you and your co-pi sit down write a paper submit it to a conference submit it to a journal something like that get published and uh, and if it gets published at like a conference then you travel to the conference and you do a talk on your your paper and everyone claps and then it's time to get more funding <laughs> you go back to step one again step one get funding right and uh your mom had the hypothesis that if you played with magnets bullets would be attracted to that magnet so i can never play with magnets that's uh yeah that doesn't seem like a very scientific uh hypothesis to me but i don't know how you would test it because you don't want to shoot people <laughs> so uh yeah but human human bodies are not magnetizable so there's there's literally zero chance that if you played with magnets a bullet would hit you and even if uh you were actively holding a magnet in your hand like the kids magnets you're playing with aren't like the one tesla you know whatever um you know they use for like mris and things like that it's not going to deflect a bullet at all all right so uh yeah so so basically what what you'll see is a lot of people treating science as like this holy and sacrosanct kind of thing like this you know you must follow the scientific method and and the reality is yeah like there there's a there's a set of like practices uh, that's probably a better way of describing the scientific method right there's a, there's a set of like sort of acceptable practices that we have in science that are designed to weed out bias like we spent last week talking about cognitive biases right the whole point of science the whole point of science is to try to eliminate the human factor and actually get at what's happening in reality right and there's no like one way of doing that like there's a lot of ways that bias can creep into science um if, if you guys have heard of a like a double blind experiment that's one way we have of limiting bias because if you're the like let's say you're administering a drug to somebody and the drug um has a side effect of making people anxious yep if you're administering it you know that you're giving somebody the placebo you're not going to be worried you know here it takes whereas when you give the drug that's going to cause people to freak out you give it to them you're like you know and then the people can read that and then they're more likely to freak out and so by having the experimenter know the results they can bias the results because expectation is incredibly powerful the placebo effect is incredibly powerful so we do what are called double blind experiments where you 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 have you know you know pill one is the control pill two is the experiment etc etc you hand them to a nurse the nurse doesn't know which are which they're just numbered one two three four five they give them to each of the people and they have no idea so it's a double blind experiment so the person administering the experiment directly to the to the control and experimental groups does not know which is which and so they cannot bias them with their expectations so um that's that's really what science is about science is about trying to eliminate human bias and and so we just have kind of a collection of techniques and uh, it's really important to like write your results down that's the mythbusters the, the mythbusters you know adam savage who's a personal hero of mine um he says science is just basically writing stuff down right in an organized fashion you do an experiment and make sure you record your results you know that's that's what he thinks the essence of science is right yeah sort of an organized record-keeping system 
and um, you know other elements of science would be like let's say you can't do a double blind experiment like if you're studying education which I do um, effective teaching then you you know it's not double blind because the person's giving the the experiment you know maybe you can do like YouTube videos or something you know and try and reduce the human impact as much as you can but a lot of times you can't and so then you have to do like what's called a quasi experimental experimental model where you match people in the experimental group with people in the control group uh, similar demographics similar test scores things like that and see if one teacher is more effective than another on two match groups and, and so there's all these like tricks and techniques um, stats is very much foundational to science. If any of you are going to work in science in the future, make sure you take stats. And if you took stats and don't understand it, like self-study or like retake it or like take more advanced stats or something like that, because stats are really how you get at what's going on. You know, and they're not perfect. They're not reliable. You know, stats always have an error in them, right? There's a possibility that this is caused by chance, you know? Um, and I know, I know, I know some people hate math and hate, you know, cause you know, it looks, it looks really scary. You know, like if you, if you look at, like, if you look at some of this stuff, right? Like it's, you know, yeah, no, thanks. You know, like you look at that and you're like, ah. Like a vampire exposed to sunlight, you know what I mean? But the reality of the situation is once you understand stats, like you actually like I don't punch in like the E to the whatever power, like there's tables that you just look up the answers, right? Like or, or you just punch the things into a calculator and the calculator says your your results are highly statistically significant, or they're not. Or, you know, this is the margin of error. Like there's calculators to do all that stuff for you. And so basically um, you just have to understand what those things are so that you can use them. They're tools. And and they're really powerful tools at like kind of getting at underlying reality and eliminating human bias and things like that. Okay. So like different fields have different parts of the scientific method they use and astrophysicists can't make a black hole. I hope maybe they can like microscopic black holes. But, you know, they can't make like a galaxy devouring black hole in the lab, right? They can only do observation. They can't really do experiment, like lab experiments, right? Like you can in chemistry. In chemistry, you can take this chemical and this chemical and mix them together and see what happens. And you can do it a bunch of times uh, to eliminate, you know, air lab mistakes and things like that. Astrophysicists can't. They, they, they're pretty much observational. They just look at the heavens and, and they make a prediction and then they're like, all right, if this happens again, my prediction will be confirmed, you know, and you just have to like wait and like hope that another quasar or whatever appears, you know, it's a different, different process. Uh, now some people don't think, uh, you know, economic, you know, is economics is a science. Um, like it's oftentimes not considered a science. It's considered an art, a humanity. Um, I think economics is a science. It's an observational science of how money works in our system, you know, and, uh, people taking calculus are laughing right now. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I don't think that math is oftentimes taught in a way that, um, is user friendly, right? Cause there's that, that first moment of like, when you see like a triple integral or something like that, you're like, ha, ah, you know, like what is happening here you know like uh, um, yeah this kind of stuff you're just like oh my gosh you know what you know and what I found is that if you have a good professor at least they will explain what each of the symbols means and kind of walk you through working with the symbols and building up your understanding from a ground level and then later on when you're advanced like all those symbols like just make it all shorthand you don't have to write as much but for like beginning people like it just feels like a punch in the face you know when you see all these like weird greek letters and you don't like what is that a d no it's got, got a weird curve to it and stuff like so yeah i think economics is a science personally it's called the dismal science in fact but a lot of people disagree with me because you're making observations and you can do experiments you know you can see what happens if you raise interest rates and things like that and so there's a guy by the name of Kuhn who studies, he's one of the most famous philosophers of science, 
or was, I think he's dead now. And he said, science is what scientists do. <laughs> so how are, you know, how are the common practices in science? That's science. Okay. So there's a big issue going on right now in science, which is called the replicability crisis or the replication crisis. It's got some other names as well. And, um, so what happened? And, and, and this doesn't actually date to 2015. Like, when I was in college, or just getting out of college, like, this kind of stuff was, like, starting to, like, be noticed and be a problem. And here, here's the problem. So out of the top 100 landmark studies in psychology, they went and reproduced all of them, right? They said, we're going to take the 100 most cited, most highly influential, most powerful studies in psychology, and we're going to try just redoing each of the experiments and see how many hold up under scrutiny. Does anyone have any idea of what percentage held up under scrutiny? So oftentimes somebody publishes a paper and they're like, we're 95% certain it's true. Okay. And then you just believe it and use it in your work. A lot of times there's no money to replicate a study. That's something that's changing too. Um, like at the conference I was at two weeks ago, they were like, please do replication studies. You know, we will publish them. You know, it's an easy, easy pickup. 39. 39 could be reproduced with the same level of statistical significance and effect size they had as the original. So that means of the 100 most cited, these aren't like random papers. These are the most influential papers that had been influencing psychology for decades. You had a better than half chance of being wrong if you believed it. If, if your reaction to every study in psychology was just to go BS and not believe it, you would have been better off than if you'd believed these highly influential, cited, 95 confidence level studies. Each one of these papers only has a 5% chance of being wrong due to chance. So, the APA defended their field, saying, well, it's a problem for other fields too. Anyone know what fallacy this is? What fallacy is it when somebody says, hey, you got a problem, man, and they're like, well, yeah, well, yeah, you do too. What fallacy is that? Tu quoque. Yeah, it's tu quoque. So, you too. And, uh, yeah. And, and to be fair, like, it does happen in other fields as well. Like, they're not wrong, you know, but, you know, it's a, certainly a problem, right? And so, the, the source of of the replication crisis has a lot to do with how academia is structured, right? I, I told you earlier that you don't form a hypothesis usually. You typically look at grant sources you know, and see what's out there, right? Oh, there's a dosi grant available. Oh, okay, what are they looking for? Oh, okay, that's my hypothesis then, you know? Um, and so in academia, there's something called the publisher parish mentality. One of my favorite professors in college, a guy by the name of Bennett Yee, he, um, uh, taught several classes that I absolutely loved and um, great professor um, and uh, this webpage he's had since I think the early 90s right um, <laughs> and uh, the last time it was updated was 2004 yeah. so um, he didn't publish enough and so they fired him he would publish like a paper a year, simply. And that wasn't good enough. And so they fired him. <clears throat> in academia, <clears throat> in academia, you're graded on two things. You're graded on how much money you pull into the department and how many papers you publish. And if you don't publish enough, you don't get tenure, you don't get tenure, you're, you're out on your ass. Now in computer science, that's not a problem because Bennett ended up at Google and made a thing called Chrome OS, which, you know, you might've heard of like a Chromebook. That was him, you know? He was like one of the lead research. I mean, he's not the only guy, but you know, he's one of the lead researchers on it. And he has a house in Palo Alto, which means you know he made it. If you can, you can afford a house in Palo Alto. Remember the talk we had a few weeks ago with Scott? You know, he has a single family home. Not Scott. Scott doesn't. Bennett does. And uh, I've been there. It's nice. You know, he, you know, he ended up okay. But like, if you're you know somebody who's in biology, you know how hard it is to get a tenure track job in biology. It's hard. It's really hard. 
And if you don't get tenure, you're out on your ass and you will never get another job in academia. And it's just like, sucks to be you. You wanted to be a professor, you're not. And there is incredible pressure on new faculty. Uh, you got five years to pull in a million dollars of grant funds and publish 20 papers. Okay. So, uh, yeah. If, so if you publish a landmark paper, it's a great way to get tenure. Oh, you're the famous guy that came up with you know, this idea. Yeah, of course we're going to. Right? And, but if you don't get a landmark paper, you know, you do, if you don't make a big discovery, then you do shovelware. You just publish a paper every month, you know. Update on this project, you know. We had some meetings and talked about it. Publish it. <laughs> it fills out your, your CV. You have 50 papers on your CV in five years. That's probably not that uncommon, honestly. Uh, I, I know people who write 10 to 20 papers a year. And I'm like, these are not good papers. Like, I don't have to read them. I just know these are not good papers. Like, you know... You've, you've, it's been a month since your last one. Like I, I highly doubt there's something new to talk about. And when I'm when I'm refereeing papers, when I'm doing peer review, I will typically vote these things down. It's like you know the last time I refereed, you know there was one that was like, yeah, we had a bunch of uh, meetings that didn't come to any conclusions. I'm like, why are you why are you telling me about this? Like what? Why, do, why does anybody care? You had a bunch of meetings and came to no conclusions. Like, literally nobody in the world cares about this. I, I don't think the people at your meetings care about them because they couldn't come to a conclusion. Like, just figure something out and, you know, once you have some results, tell us. You know, it's, it's absolutely abhorrent to me. So, um, a, another big problem is that negative findings don't get published. And that's something they're also encouraging at the conference because this replication crisis has been a problem for a while. The, uh, the conclusion, there is no conclusion. Yeah. Yeah, we had meetings and nothing happened. So we thought you should know and we thought we should be published so that we could get it on our CV and like people could read our paper and they could know nothing happened. No, no, no. When I'm refereeing papers, I'm like, no. Uh, yeah, uh, gladiator thumbs down, I'm sorry. Uh, nobody cares. Now, negative findings is different. So a negative finding means like we tried coming up with a, like uh, we, we tried uh, giving rabbits a high salt diet and it turns out it made no difference whatsoever that would be a negative finding we thought that uh giving rabbits a high salt diet would increase would prolong their qt interval and it didn't that's actually an interesting finding but a lot of times negative findings don't get published because because it, it's like we tried something and it didn't work you know we tried giving anti-malarial drugs to people with cancer and uh, it didn't work you know and you might think, well, of course, why it's an anti-malarial drug. Why would it affect cancer? Guess what? Some of them actually do. I learned that from when I was working with uh, the UCSF people here in Fresno. There's actually some uh, anti-malarial drugs that actually have very beneficial effects on cancer. But, like, maybe somebody was like, all right, well, we'll take that drug and try it on different cancers. We'll try pancreatic cancer and liver cancer, and, and maybe it only works on, like, one of them. But all those negative results are actually valuable. But a lot of times, they don't get published. They don't get into the big journals. Nature magazine you know, isn't going to publish a study saying, hey, we tried this drug and it didn't, it didn't work. You don't, you don't get your name in the headlines for, for trying things that don't work. Now, the ivermectin study, there was, that finally came out, I think, yesterday, where they found out that ivermectin doesn't help with COVID. Finally, I think. It's finally definitive, I guess. And that, that was actually headlines, right? Because that was like a huge political deal. Does ivermectin help with COVID? And Trump was pushing it. Joe Rogan, you know, took ivermectin after he got COVID. And um, and apparently it doesn't do anything. So that was like yesterday that came out. And that was big headline news, right? So sometimes, I guess. But most of the time, um, yeah, we tried something, it didn't work. It doesn't get published, and that's a problem. So if you're only publishing positive findings, then, um, then you're introducing a bias, right? You're introducing a bias. And then people will shop their uh, papers around, right? And so if you, if you get rejected from a tier one, journal then you try tier two journal if you get rejected from that you go to a tier three journal and you keep going until you find some peer reviewers who are uh, suckers enough to publish your paper and then lots of incremental work um yeah that i just it, it drives me crazy like I, I understand why they do it but it just drives me crazy because like i don't care about an update on your project most of the time like i'm sorry gather data get come to a conclusion then i'll take a look at it like i don't care that you're halfway through your study you don't have any data for me like 
why are you telling me this? Why are you wasting my time? Why are you wasting everybody's time? Yeah. So, um, all right, see ya. Um, yeah, and then and then I'll, I'll just stop after this one. So another big issue is that if there's a five percent chance that a paper is uh, the results of, in a paper are due to chance, if you just run a lot of experiments, you're going to get some interesting results that are just completely due to chance. Does that make sense? It's so like, that's usually the threshold for science. Like, the threshold for science is there is less than a 5% chance that the results of the study are due to chance. So you feed people gumdrops and see if they grow taller. Okay. They don't. Cool. So you feed them a, di a different color. You feed them a different color. You feed them a different you Try 20 of them. And one of them, you just happen to roll lucky and those people grew taller. And you're like, oh. Uh... Look at that. Green gumdrops cause people to grow taller. And you publish it. It's a big landmark finding. <laughs> yeah, so the cutoff uh, for p-values is usually less than 0.05. So 0.05 is, means there's a 5% chance it was due to chance, right? And uh, if you get exactly 0.05, <laughs> there it's saying redo the calculation, so it doesn't look it doesn't look fake, right? Significant on the edge of significance, highly suggestive, significant at the 0 0.0 point ten level. You look at this interesting analysis, highly significant. Yeah, so that's that's what it's it's a joke, but it's also kind of like actually what p values mean. If you get a really low p value, that means you're very certain that your results are true. Um, let's see here. Jelly beans cause acne. Scientists investigate. We found no link between jelly beans and acne. I hear that settles it. I hear it's only a certain color that causes it. Scientists. We found no link between purple jelly beans and acne. We found no link between brown jelly beans and acne. We found no link between pink jelly beans and acne. Dun, 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 dun. We found a link between green jelly beans and acne. And then the science press goes crazy. Green jelly beans linked to acne. 95% confidence. Only 5% chance of coincidence. But if you run 20 experiments, you know, Run twenty experiments. You're gonna you're gonna get some random chance up in there. So, just with all the number huge number of experiments going on, uh, the five percent chance that it's due to chance is not five percent because you're selecting you're selecting this and you're not reproducing the results. And so it's it's a pretty serious issue, right? Like if if you can't trust science, then what can you trust? You know what I mean? So this is this has been a known problem for the last seven years or so, even re really longer. And so they're, they're commissioning a lot more re reproduction studies and um, encouraging people to submit negative results and things like that. So it's arguably getting better. You know, I'm not encouraging you to go out and disbelieve science or whatever, but it's a problem. You know, it's like this, this is a terrifying number. When, when 61 out of 100 papers could not reproduce, and some of them did reproduce, but just at a very weak level, like they, like the the scientists had overstated the effect or overstated the confidence level. Regardless, these were landmark papers, and so if sixty one percent of them were wrong, in one way or another, that's terrifying. Okay, so it's it, if you're going to be working in science, this is something you need to really pay careful attention to, and um, we'll pick it up next time. All right, thanks everybody. See ya.